According to the World Health Organization, in 2018, nine out of 10 of us were breathing air containing high levels of pollutants, causing the premature deaths of about 7 million people worldwide. It won't surprise you to hear that a lot of that pollution came from outdoor sources like big industry, transportation, and coal-fired power plants. All that fuel combustion and all those industrial processes spew out millions of tons of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, which enters our lungs as tiny sulfate and nitrate particles, causing strokes, heart disease, lung cancer, and other chronic respiratory problems. And of course, those processes also produce massive quantities of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that enter the planet's atmosphere, trapping some of the infrared radiation leaving our planet's surface and causing our average global temperature to increase rapidly with all the catastrophic consequences that we're now beginning to witness around the world. But of course, in early January 2020, all of that began to change as we unwittingly embarked upon the largest environmental experiment ever conducted in the history of our global civilization. Levels of air pollutants and greenhouse gases have been falling dramatically since then all over the world. So once this horrible pandemic has finally passed, and after we come out of the end of the inevitable global economic depression that will follow, will the world have learnt any lessons from the experience, or like a weak-willed drug addict emerging from rehab, will we collectively rush back to business as usual? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Between early February and March 2020, the world's largest polluter, China, saw a reduction of about 250 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions. And that's more than half our entire annual emissions here in the United Kingdom. The Independent Commodity Intelligence Services Consultancy has carried out initial assessments of carbon dioxide emissions across the European Union and their results suggest a reduction of almost 400 million tonnes for 2020 compared to what had been previously predicted before the virus struck. That represents about 9% of the total 2020 EU target. India looks set to be the next major nation to see significant drops in air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. At the time of filming this video, India's lockdown has only just begun, so it's too early for definitive analysis at this stage, but it seems likely that very similar reductions in carbon dioxide and other gases will be registered across that country too. Data from the United Kingdom already shows reduced levels of pollutants and greenhouse gases. In London, rush hour traffic flows are around 40% below average, according to data from TomTom. Meanwhile, carbon emissions associated with air transport have also fallen sharply, with major UK airlines grounding around 80% of their fleets. Emissions from aviation could be down by as much as 800,000 tonnes a day, according to Tim Johnson of the Aviation Environment Federation. He says that's the equivalent of removing more than 17,000 cars from the roads for an entire year. Of course, in the current circumstances, it's hard to get too excited about these reductions. A dip in emissions that comes alongside premature deaths and widespread suffering and economic hardship isn't really any reason for celebration. But it also can't be ignored Analysts say that this huge drop in greenhouse gases may well result in 2020 becoming the first year since the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, when the graph of global CO2 emissions actually tips downwards. In her article for National Geographic, published on the 3rd of April 2020, Madeline Stone interviews Glenn Peters, Research Director at the Centre for International Climate and Environment Research in Oslo, Norway. His view is that the economic fallout from the pandemic will almost likely drag on for some years and could potentially lead to a worldwide emissions dip of 1% or more, similar to what we witnessed after the 2009 financial crash. But of course, time and tide wait for no man. And as the clock ticks on through April and China starts to unlock its citizens and economy, we can already see pollution levels beginning to rise again there. Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, Fatih Birol, has written extensively about the need to put clean energy at the heart of stimulus plans as we come out of our current global lockdown. His view is that we shouldn't allow today's crisis to compromise our efforts to tackle the world's inescapable climate challenge. Birol makes the point that the cost of key renewable technologies like solar and wind are far lower than during previous periods when governments were forced to apply stimulus packages to their economies, and the technology for both solar and wind is in much better shape than in the past. Meanwhile, he says carbon capture and hydrogen energy and storage technologies are in need of major investment to scale them up 
and bring down costs. Birrell argues that this could be helped by current interest rate levels, which are low and getting lower, making the finance of big projects more affordable. And he argues that governments must play a crucial role here in making clean energy even more attractive to private investors by providing guarantees and contracts to reduce financial risks. Analysis carried out by the International Energy Agency shows that governments directly or indirectly drive more than 70% of global energy investments. Birrell suggests there's a very specific opportunity for globally coordinated government policy to remove the 400 billion US dollars of subsidies currently being paid to the oil industry more than 40% of which are paid to oil producers simply to enable them to make oil products cheaper. Battling against that progress is a global glut of crude oil caused by a perfect storm of a global pandemic, coupled with the childish intransigence of Russia and the Gulf states, leading to a crash in oil prices. Ironically, the sharp drop in demand along with prices of less than $30 a barrel may well cause permanent damage to America's fracking industry where extraction costs mean that producers need a minimum price of about $40 a barrel to remain profitable. And societal shifts that have occurred as a result of coronavirus lockdowns, like widespread telecommuting and holding conferences virtually, could give the world a little extra momentum towards lower energy consumption and lower carbon emissions. In her National Geographic article, Madeline Stone suggests that strong governmental support for clean energy via stimulus initiatives like tax credits for renewable power and electric vehicles, investments in low carbon infrastructure and building efficiency could tilt economies in a greener, more climate friendly direction in the wake of the pandemic. But history also teaches us that very low oil prices tend to lead consumers to use fuel less efficiently. So we appear to be in uncharted territory here. What's going to happen? Do we see any hints of green recovery policies coming from governments around the world yet? How about the world's biggest polluter and second largest economy? Since 2013, President Xi Jinping has staked a considerable amount of his political reputation on his vast green belt and road initiative. So you might think he now has a historic opportunity to drive through his green agenda. But as this dedicated website points out, there are many pitfalls to overcome. The report's author, Christopher Nedapil Wang, warns that the aftermath of the virus poses two environmental risks as the country attempts to accelerate the implementation of recovery projects. Firstly, existing environmental safeguards and regulations might be allowed to loosen. And secondly, human nature means that there may well be a focus on well-known and easy to implement technologies based on dirty carbon heavy energy rather than innovative new green solutions. Wang proposes that contingency plans first need to be in place to soften economic impacts and minimise the temptation to reach for the cheapest and most familiar activities. He envisages trade credit support for exporters on both sides, coupled with special funds from the international community to help countries affected by slowing trade and investments from China. And he suggests that China's leadership could use this crisis to accelerate its goal of building an ecological society by using the economic stimulus after the crisis to double down on green technologies, green processes and green industries, both domestically and internationally. So how about over here in Europe then? Well, according to this Bloomberg report, the European Union is set to make greening the economy an essential part of the recovery programme. At the end of March 2020, heads of government agreed to make their emergency measures compatible with the principles set out in the Green Deal. Details still need to be fleshed out, but the pledge offers reassurance for investors who want to take stakes in climate projects and are looking to see how their work will be treated in stimulus packages now evolving worldwide. Europe's aiming to zero out greenhouse gas emissions by the middle of the century in its far-reaching environmental cleanup. Its Green Deal, which was launched shortly before the virus outbreak, will overhaul everything from transport to energy production and agriculture, putting Europe's ambitions on climate change ahead of most other major polluters. Similar policies are being called for here in the United Kingdom as well. Interviewed for The Independent Online, Laurie Milliverta, an analyst for the Centre for Research on Energy and Clean Air, suggests there's a growing body of opinion against a return to business as usual at the end of the lockdown period here, with many policy groups urging the government to focus any economic recovery package on supporting the growth of green industries. You do have the risk of a rebound in air pollution, he says, if there's a black recovery based on high carbon industries. 
The reductions in air pollutant levels in the past weeks have meant thousands of air pollution deaths have been avoided. If you can make those gains permanent, that would be an enormous public health benefit. And then we come to the good old US of A. The Trump administration's decision in early April to roll back Obama era fuel efficiency standards, along with the recent economic stimulus bill's $50 billion bailout of the airline industry, suggests that for now, the US government at least is not seeking to reduce fossil fuel use in its post-coronavirus future. But at least 24 states still remain committed to achieving the climate target set out in the 2015 Paris Agreement. And a recent open letter published at the online site medium.com sets out a very clear roadmap towards a green recovery. This green stimulus proposal demands a further economic injection of at least $2 trillion that they say should be aimed at creating millions of family sustaining green jobs, lifting standards of living, accelerating a just transition off fossil fuels, ensuring a controlling state for the public in all private sector bailout plans, and helping to make America's society and economy stronger and more resilient in the face of pandemics, recessions, and climate emergencies in the years ahead. So, you know, fairly comprehensive. But they don't stop there. Oh no, they say the package will need to be automatically renewed at 4% of GDP per year, which equates to about $850 billion, until the economy is fully decarbonized and the unemployment rate is below 3.5%. The proposal aligns with an initiative put forward by over 300 environmental, justice, labor, and movement organizations called the Five Principles for Just COVID-19 Relief and Stimulus. Those five principles look like this. Health is the top priority for all people with no exceptions. Economic relief must be provided directly to the people. Workers and communities need to be financially rescued, not corporate executives. A down payment must be made on a regenerative economy while preventing future crises. And the American democratic process must be protected while protecting each other. And the authors say they found majority support among Democrats, Republicans and independents for a range of public green investments from renewable energy to electric buses, underground high voltage transmission, electric minivans and pickup trucks for rural and suburban areas, smart grid technology, retrofitting buildings with an emphasis on low income housing and battery technology. So I guess the question is, can we convince ourselves that by dialing down from our current levels of consumption and perhaps embracing new levels of restraint and discipline in our daily lives, we might just avoid the possibility of a future where restrictions similar to those we're currently enduring become a permanent self-inflicted reality? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. That's it for this week though. A massive thank you as always to the channel supporters over at Patreon who make these programs possible. If you'd like to get more involved with the channel and have your say in monthly content polls, then you can do that by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can show your support for the channel for free by hitting the like button and by subscribing, both of which massively help to get our message to more and more people each week. It's dead easy to subscribe. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notified about new content. As always, thanks very much for watching. Stay safe and don't go too stir crazy and have a good week if you can. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.